For nearly a decade, Ali has been executive director of the National Immigration Forum, an advocacy organization that promotes the value of immigrants and immigration. Uh, born in California, Ali is the son of Pakistani immigrants. After getting his undergraduate degree at uh, Berkeley and a master's in public health at Boston University, he worked on community health and environmental issues in Massachusetts for a while and eventually sifted to immigration matters. He served as executive direc director of the Massachusetts Immigrant and Refugee Advocacy Coalition before joining the National Immigration Forum, where he's earned a rep quite a great reputation as a committed and effective coalition builder. His new book, There Goes the Neighborhood, How Communities Overcome Prejudice and Meet the Challenge of American Immigration. Uh, Ali draws on interviews with dozens of people from a cross section of society to explore the influences and challenges of immigration in the United States. He introduces readers to the cops, the pastors, the farmers, the teachers, the entrepreneurs, and many others who are dealing with one side or the other, or even sometimes both sides at once of the immigration issue. Along the way, he documents a wide range of responses but finds an overall a growing openness to and appreciation of diversity. A review in Kirkus commented on the book for providing a solid advice for an anxious and angry polity on how to talk about a growing cultural challenge. And a New York Journal of Books called Ali's work a timely, important read for all interested in this debate. Ali will be in co conversation with dreamer and immigrant rights leader Lorella Priyelli who has served as a Latino Outreach Director for Hillary Clinton's presidential campaign. Um, also, we'd like to note that we have uh, National Immigration Forum represented here uh, tonight. There's, a, in fact, a sign-up sheet if you'd like to learn more, and a couple re representatives here if you have any questions uh, about what National Immigration Forum does. And also uh, co-supported by the Center for Community uh, Change, and we thank for, for them for being involved. Now, if you will, please join me in welcoming Ali and Lorelli. Good evening, everyone. Oh, we're gonna try that again because I am an organizer at heart and feel strongly that events only go as well as we here up on stage relate to those who are part of the crowd tonight. Good evening, everyone. Good All right, much better, much better. We'll get there throughout the night. Wait, until, is, the, wait until the second. <laughs> it is an honor to be here with my dear friend, Ali Narani. Uh, to be supporting the National Immigration Forum and to be in Busboys and Poets, thank you for hosting us. Um, I'm very excited about many parts of this book, but I feel like we can't have a serious conversation about the book until we talk about Ali Narani's fashion decisions tonight. <laughs> and I say this because it's been a real part of the process. Uh, I don't know, if, do any of you follow Ali Narani on Instagram? All right, some, some people, some people. But you know that there is a lot going on with the socks and trying to figure out what's the right socks and what was the right type of outfit to bring uh, you know, out into the book tour. And I just wanted to know, you know, an up or down vote, how do you think he's doing today? Yeah. All right. <laughs> and we're out, thank you very much. <laughs> anyway, I um, feel like we have to start with some good humor and good energy. And you know, I, in reading this book, Ali, you know, immigration is in, just a policy matter or a political matter uh, for me and I think for many of us who work in this space. Uh, I am now a US citizen, but I spent the first, my first 14 years in the United States as an undocumented immigrant, as a dreamer. And I wasn't always in the fight in this way. I didn't always know I was undocumented. I grew up in New Milford, Connecticut, which is a small town in the western part of Connecticut and when, when my family and I first moved there, it was mostly white. Um, and it's changed over, over the years. And so I wonder what the conversation today is like in New Milford. But I feel like we have so much to learn about the conversations that we've missed, the things we've overseen, and how we ultimately get there. If the solution is, and, and the sort of the task at hand is how do we bring out 11 million undocumented Americans out of the shadows? You know, but how does America wrestle with this very important question of what does it mean to be an American and what is our do we have a national identity? What is it? And so I have a lot of questions, but I was wondering if you could start by telling us why you decided to write this book uh, and maybe sharing a little bit about the book with us. Sure, well, I, first of all, I, I really want to thank Lorella. I've, um, 
I think I've known you since the first week you came to DC. Um, has always been just a, an incredible advocate, an incredible friend. Um, and thank you very much for uh, being up here this evening. And I want to thank uh, the Center for Community Change for co-sponsoring this uh, evening's event. Um, everybody at the center I've uh, come to know over the time, and they've always been great supporters and great friends and great allies. Um, and then the National Immigration Forum staff, and a number, number of board members are in the room. And then there's just a lot of friends and some family here, too. So I just wanted to start with a big thank you. Um, tremendously grateful for everybody coming out tonight, but also supporting the project, whether I bothered you for an interview, bothered you for advice, or um, uh, you know, you just kind of said, OK, you know, put your head down and get this done, Ali, and stop whining about it. Um, so in terms of reading, uh, part of the book that I want to start with is the, the first chapter. And the first chapter is very much about um, one specific day in 2010, December 18th. And on December 18th, 2010, two things happened. One was Don't Ask, Don't Tell was repealed. And the other is that the DREAM Act failed, in the US, both in the US Senate. And on that day, and kind of the lead, as I reflected back on 2010 as a year, um, I came to the conclusion that we had to do something different as the National Immigration Forum. So I want to read the last few paragraphs of the first chapter. While politics is power, we learned political power does not guarantee legislative change, much less cultural change. Many will respond that in the relatively near future, America will become a majority minority population where people of color will outnumber those who identify as white. But that moment is still decades away. Right now, too many Americans <coughs> and media assume there goes the neighborhood when immigrants become a part of their communities. Until conservative white America sees the cultural and demographic changes to their neighborhoods as a net positive to their lives, this will remain the assumption, and the identity wars will only worsen. What we fail to realize is that people are scared, not necessarily in a bad way, but they're scared they will lose their jobs, then their homes. And they're scared of the new neighbors who look and sound different, who might be coming for their jobs and their homes. With this fear comes a lack of trust and a lack of respect. Opponents of immigra immigrants and immigration reform prey on this fear to their benefit. Supporters ignore this fear to their peril, which is what this story is about, a different approach to the immigration debate. This is not a story about the next legislative fight. This is a story about Americans dealing with immigration to their neighborhoods. What America struggles with is bigger than any one piece of legislation. I believe that by not understanding the fears behind America's identity crisis, we fail to provide the framework and vehicle through which we can reach Americans' hearts and minds. Solving this problem is not impossible, it requires each of us to meet someone where they are, but not leave them there. Thank you. And so what you did throughout this book is you traveled the country, you talked to people on the East Coast, but you also traveled to Middle America, you went to Texas, you spoke to people in California. And so I'm wondering, what is that, the process locally? How do people begin to see immigration as a net positive in their communities? So if you could share a little bit about your stories. Maybe there is a story in the book that best tells that. So I spent uh, about a week in uh, South Carolina, in Spartanburg, South Carolina. It's an uh, upstate um, this community of about, let's say, 60,000 people. Uh, South Carolina itself has seen the fastest growth in the Latino communi community, with the second only to North Carolina. So South Carolina has been uh, um, undergoing this massive change culturally, but also economically. And the way that I wrote it is that um, as the textile mills went to Mexico, Mexico moved to South Carolina. And what I found there, and I, it was you know, replicated in other, other parts of the country in one way or another, is that there were institutions on the ground that helped facilitate this change. I talked to um, the principal, former principal of Arcadia Elementary School that had seen 20, 30% growth in the Latino student population talked to teachers who were not only in the elementary school, but also uh, uh, teaching uh, GED and ESL classes. These were institutions that were helping students uh, um, get to know each other and create relationships. But then I also talked to um, the uh, leadership of the First Baptist Church in Spartanburg. They were doing an incredible job of resettling re Syrian refugees. And remember, these conversations all took place right over the course of the 2016 election. So this is not a time in the country where you know, things were calm. This was a time when all these issues were top 
above the fold. But these were conservative South Carolinians engaging in the debate through their institutions and helping not only the, a new community integrate, but an old community integrate as well. So I worked on the Hillary Clinton campaign leading her Latino vote program and one of these questions I have for sort of the end of the campaign um, was, you know, the last two weeks of the campaign, we spent a lot of time driving the power of the Latino vote narrative. And uh, because everywhere that we had, that we saw early vote where the Latino vote made a significant difference, and even in places where they are a smaller percentage of the electorate, like in North Carolina, by just 2%, it was true that Latinos were coming out in numbers we hadn't seen before. Um, and everywhere that we looked, the headlines read, you know, this is the Latino election, et cetera. And I, I've always wondered, and you know, there maybe isn't an answer to this, but to what, you know, what role do you think that played, uh, given the conversations you've had and the places you've visited in America, in sort of uh, the backlash of people, so, you know, you talk a lot about people feeling like they're losing their country or they're losing their community. Uh, and so can you tell us a little bit more about what, how do people describe that feeling? So a lot of this plays, so another example from the book. Um, I spent a, a handful of days in suburban Houston. So in Houston I interview, and Houston not many, I don't think most Americans understand what an amazing city Houston is. Houston is now the most diverse city in the country. Harris County is a top five most diverse uh, county in the country. So there's all these dynamics in Houston. Uh, so there I interviewed Adrian Garcia, who was the former sheriff, ran for Congress, ran for mayor. I also spent some time in Sugarland, uh, uh, Texas, which is about 20 miles southwest of, of town. Um, it's by and large an affluent South Asian, Asian community. And then about 30 miles to the east, I went to uh, Pasadena. Pasadena, to get to your, your question, is about 60% Hispanic, 40% white. And the political battle that's happening there is incredible. And it was at that place that I think that the political fight between the Latino and the entrenched Anglo community, which, that's healthy. You know, it, Paul, you know decisions are made through political fights, um, was getting really ugly. Um, the Voting Rights Act was, you know, was uh, uh, undermined by the Supreme Court at, a, at the precise time that the city council was trying to redistrict the city. Um, but as I looked at, Sugar, at Sugarland, as I, I'm sorry, at Pasadena, as well as other parts of the country, every time we, as you know, part of the movement, would make a political case to the public, the public would say, "Okay, that triggers an economic anxiety, a racial anxiety." And I'm not saying that political case isn't important. But we haven't always figured out how to wed that political case with a cultural case. Um, and you know, the thesis that I advanced through the book is that the immigration debate is more about culture and values than about politics and policy. And I think that we've always led with politics and policy, and that's what's triggered a lot of this backlash. So if we were coming up, you know, if we had another legislative fight in front of us today, we've made the political case over and over again, how would you have, what is the conversation you would want to see advocates drive? What is the, you know, if, if the National Immigration Forum had millions of dollars to unleash organizers and communications professionals throughout the country, what is the conversation that you would want them to uh, engage the local community in? Well, first of all, the political case and the growth and the case that the Latino and the Asian vote is growing in influence, uh, either in the public sector or in the private sector, is important. Anything, you know, nothing happens without that pressure point, without that foundation, uh, without the, the strength and the vitality of the immigrant community. What we've done at the forum over the last five, six years is really work parallel to the traditional immigrant rights movement so that we've tried to engage conservative faith, law enforcement, business leaders in this coalition that's come to be known as Bibles, Badges, and Business for Immigration Reform. And what, what we realized through the work, what I really came to appreciate through the book and through the process of, of doing the interviews is that you, know, you can't hire an organizer or a communications professional to pull that off. You know, we've been successful because we found people from these conservative communities 
who are willing to have those conversations, who are willing to kind of get through the, all those awkward steps that, you know, with all due respect to any political operatives in the room, a political operative just can't do. Um, and that's how I think you have cultural change, is that you're finding the folks that an audience trusts. May not always agree with them, but they trust them. And that we found that it's the you know, pastor, the police chief, the business owner, is that's the person that a conservative voter will trust. They're not gonna trust me. I'm not even gonna ask for their trust. I'm gonna ask them to work with the folks that are from their communities. So sort of like national surrogate versus local surrogate, right? And finding the most effective spokespeople in the community? More than surrogate. Um, I think it's, it's because I, I think sometimes when we use the term surrogate, it's kind of, you're gonna go there and you're gonna deliver a talking point. Mm -hmm. This is a person who, you know, a handful of our staff are pastors themselves. You know, we have people who have come from law enforcement. I mean, they have the credibility, the expertise, uh, and, and the track record to say, okay, I'm not giving you a talking point. I'm not, you know, trying to convince you. I'm just trying to sit down and have a conversation on how do right. we move forward. So why do you think we failed in 2013, 2014, on getting, you know, getting it through the Senate but not being able to get it through the House? I think that I think a lot of different players own that failure. Um, I think you know members of Congress certainly do. I think the administration plays a role. I think in terms of the things that we could have controlled, mm -hmm. um, I think that you know from our perspective as the forum, I would have wanted to engage more on the law enforcement side of the equation because what I found, again through the research and uh, as I as I was doing the writing, is that this debate has been or this issue has been conflated with national security and public safety. I think more than ever. Um, and frankly, you know, candidate Trump and now President Trump has been able to conflate national security with immigration and refugee resettlement in ways that I don't think we even saw after 9-11. Um, and that has what, that's really made, I think, the debate and uh, much more difficult and has made the anxiety and the fears that people feel all the harder to overcome. I'm going to come back to this sentence in your book. A significant portion of the American electorate felt their country had been taken away. And this isn't just from 2016. You were talking about McCain-Obama. But it is what happened in 2016. And so I wonder if you could speak about how did Trump, how was he able to speak about immigrants the way that he did? Um, and not just immigrants. He spoke about Hispanics that way. He spoke about people of color. Um, he demonized immigrants, and, and he's still doing that now, only he's president and he has a lot more power. Um, so I wonder if you could speak to sort of how did we get there? How, what, is it, what does it say about our country? Um, and how do we come back from that? One of the uh, surveys, that, one of the studies that I cite is uh, from last summer. Um, it was an analysis of the Gallup survey. Um, and the Gallup survey for folks is a sample of about 90, 95,000 people. So it's a great data set. They found that roughly a third of that data set wa uh, would identify as Trump voters. They uh, lived in culturally isolated communities and they were worried their children would not do better than them. So for them it was a combination of cultural and economic anxiety that Trump was able to tap into. Um, you know, I interviewed a number of folks who voted for Trump. We, we work every day with folks who voted for Trump. They are supporters of immigration reform, but they made that decision on election day based on a range of factors. Mm -hmm. um, now I think there's a realization that one of the few campaign promises that Trump made that he's sticking to is immigration. So we're talking to more and more Trump voters and we're reading about them every day in the press who are saying, who are asking the question, okay, where is this going on the immigration policy issue? Um, and they're not, they're worried. Because even, and even over the course of the campaign, a number of conservative leaders were pushing back against the Trump campaign in really, really powerful ways. Um, so I think it's, it's incorrect and short-sighted of us to just assume that everybody who's a Trump voter buys into the entire agenda. Um, just like, you know, anybody who was a Clinton voter you know, they may not have necessarily bought, bought into the entire agenda. And I think we have to, to understand where we're gonna agree with people and where we're gonna disagree with them. But do we ignore, there is maybe a small percentage of hard anti-immigrant, just like there is a small percentage of hard pro-immigrant people in the United States. 
is are we more worried about the people in the middle? Is your strategy going out there talking to people that you can pull into, you know, engage in that conversation? You know, I remember being on a stage in Connecticut and giving a talk and referring to myself, this is when I didn't have any papers, referring to myself as an undocumented American. And this woman came up to me after the event and she couldn't let it go that I had called myself American. And you know, I engaged, I had sort of a 10 minute conversation with her and towards the end of the conversation, you know, I made a decision to say, well, clearly we're not, you know, we just see the world, dif the perspe our perspectives are so different, we're never gonna agree. I'm undocumented, but I believe in them. I feel in my heart and in my body that I'm an American. And that's why I'm here, I'm fighting for us I'm fighting for our country, and she could she could never see that. Um, and so I wonder, are those the, the people that you're engaging with when you're having a conversation about the cultural changes people are are living through, the demographic changes, um, or are you more focused on getting people in the middle? So the way that you know we do oversimplify the American public is that you have 20 percent of folks who are with us on everything, you have 20 percent of folks who are against us on everything. We're worried about, and we're focused on the 60% in the middle. And the 60% in the middle, did I do my math right there? 20 plus 20. Okay, good. Not a, just want to make sure. Um, that 60% in, in the middle, they, are, they will swing with kind of where leadership takes them, whether it's the White House, member, their, their uh, member of Congress, elected officials, et cetera. Um, so we try to, and through the book, really tried to understand where that 60% is. Um, because, you know, even when you look at the polling, the polling will say 60% plus percent of the American public, Republican or Democrat, are with you on immigration reform. But you've got to unpack that, mm -hmm. um, especially on an issue like immigration, which is so complicated. And, you know, people have infinitely more ways to say no to immigration reform than to say yes. So we're really trying to understand that 60% in any one part of the country, you know, who are they going to trust? You know, what's their values framework? Mm -hmm. Another curious question. I'm just getting all of my questions that I have for Ali Narani on stage. Um, no but way. another <laughs> question I've been curious about since the election is, you know, something else also happened in the last eight years, and you do talk about it in your book, which is, you know, the, the immigrant rights movement grew, and it was built uh, by some people in this room um, over the years. Um, a lot of investment went in. Uh, dreamers came out and told their stories and humanized the issue. Um, so it's, it, it wasn't just a policy issue anymore. But I guess I wonder how, you know, you talk about sort of the power of dreamers and, and the story of dreamers in moving this debate forward. Um, but I'm curious, when you're having conversations locally, do you feel like people see, people who may not understand this issue yet, do they see undocumented adults as worthy, um, as American as their kids, as the dreamers? Um, and how, how do we begin to do that? Because I feel like that's been the struggle of the last few years. Um, you know, when I came to DC in 2010, it was still, um, I am undocumented, um, I came here through no fault of my own, and we didn't realize, I think, until shortly after that, that the way that we were telling our stories uh, wasn't uplifting the courage or recognizing the courage our parents had made um, in deciding to bring us to the United States. Um, and so, I'm, you know, I'm curious about what happens locally. Um, how do we? How do? How do people? understand undocumented workers or day laborers or our parents? Well, I mean, this is the challenge is that, you know, while we feel, you know, if we live in D.C. or New York or California or Texas or, you know, South Florida, we feel that, okay, our community is diverse. Therefore, every community is diverse. I mean, the fact is, is that for the majority of the country, only now are immigrants starting to become part of those cities and towns. So most Americans, I think, are only going through the cultural changes that the coast experienced 10, 10, 20 years ago, they're going through them right now. So I you know, interviewed a number of folks who grew up in you know, communities that were all white. And they arrived at a position in support of immigrants and immigration, you know, often through their, their, their faith. 
There were a number of people, law enforcement, religious leaders, who said that they turned to their Bible for guidance on uh, welcoming in, in the stranger to their community and what that meant. And that tension between welcoming somebody who's undocumented or broke a law as against being a nation of laws. And how do you navigate? How do you negotiate that tension? And that's, that is incredibly difficult for somebody to do who doesn't have a personal experience with an immigrant. Um, but that's slowly changing. And I think one of the, the reasons that's changing is that, number one, these institutions, schools or churches are becoming more diverse and they're the place where these conversations can happen. But the Deferred Action Program, DACA, Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, um, that program, the way I, we put it is that it protected 750,000 young people from deportation. And that's incredibly important. I would argue that it's just as important that millions and millions and millions of Americans have come to realize that their child's best friend is undocumented, the family one pew over in church is undocumented, the family down the street is undocumented. And so regardless of what happens to this program under this administration, those millions of Americans, they can't unremember that. Mm -hmm. Even if they don't have that personal relationship. Um, so that's, I mean, there, it's, it's a change, you know, th these things are, they're, it's not black and white. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like a person wakes up one morning and says, I'm anti-immigrant, right. and goes to bed at night and says, oh, immigrants, cool, I'm good with that. Um, you know, it's a process. And sort of uh, in this conversation about movement and the time that we're in, uh, I'm also curious about how do we balance, uh, we, we've had a movement now in the last decade, longer than a decade, in different parts of the country much longer than that. Um, we, you know, I was part of United We Dream before joining the campaign, and under the Obama years, we saw, you know, we, we took it upon ourselves to make the political case, to, to, to drive our personal narratives uh, with the goal of having you know, a policy change, but also um, it was really awful to be undocumented for me personally for many years before I came into contact with anyone in the movement. And then I showed up at a, at a conference, a United We Dream conference, and I walked in, there were 200 people, and they were wearing undocumented and unafraid shirts, and they were all happy, and I could not understand why they were all so excited. I'm like, what is wrong with you people? Uh, you know, and it, it, it almost, it happened, it was instant, uh, that all of a sudden I started to uh, wrestle with all of my feelings and, and begin to feel proud um, of my identity. And so we've had now, we have an activist base um, and group of people that have come, you know, they've come into their activism under the Obama years where our job was to push and to pressure and to organize. And we sort of started speaking from a values-based uh, framework to more of a rights, demands, and justice framework. And I wonder how you balance, because I do think we, we do need to get back to a combination of those um, because I think we've lost a lot of our values-based messaging over the years. But how do you balance you know, a movement uh, that's, that's come about under the Obama years um, with you know, the, the tasks at, at hand because of the Trump presidency? So it's almost, you know, how, how do you balance between a, a movement that has really come of age through political power, um, but then take a step a little bit sideways to kind of bring everybody else along? Because I, I think that a number of folks across the country responded to that, the emergence of political power in a very defensive way. Um, and what I grapple with these days is how do you do that in a way that's not disempowering? Um, because the last thing that we want to do is disempower the community, right? right? Um, so I think there's, there's two, two things here. One is I think the institutions that we know um, schools, churches. I think there are a number of business owners who now see their immigrant workforce more as an extension of their family and their community than as people working for them. Uh, so how do you engage business in a different way? Mm -hmm. um, but it's also asking, you know, the native-born South Carolinian to speak on behalf of a DACA recipient. And you know, have the doctor, have the, the community member be there, but not necessarily worry about having their voice heard. Um, and that doesn't have to be disempowering. I think it can be actually quite empowering because 
you know, now the, 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 the message is broader and the voices are broader. Um, and that may be too simplistic, but I think there has to be a, new, a slight nuanced change to the way we are having this conversation. Okay, I have two more questions and then we're gonna open it up for you all. Um, one question is you talked about, there were also alarming experiences that you had while you were out in the, in the country. And so I wonder if you could share with us, you know, what were some of your most alarming experiences? Uh, there were things that you welcomed that, that didn't shock you, but there were things that really shocked you um, as you were interviewing people or as you were doing the work. Well, I'm not going to give details because, I mean, those, the conversations that I was part of, um, people trusted me and I trusted them. And, you know, there's a, you know, we may not agree on every point, but I'm going to respect their, per their points of view on different issues as I hope they would respect mine. But, you know, this strategy, this particular approach that we have and, you know, in these conversations, every time and then somebody would say something like, okay, I'm in this room. <laughs> and, you know, it's not, my, it's, uh, it's not my job to challenge people on these other issues. Now, I've definitely reached a place where there are folks who are incredibly socially or politically conservative where we can have, uh, you know, emotional but rational conversations about a range of things. But it took us a while to get there. Um, and, yeah, I mean, if, if I'm pretty sure that those moments were just as awkward for the other person as they were for me. Um, but since we had established a level of trust and respect in the, in the, in the relationship, you could, get, you could get through it. Okay, final question is, um, what gives you hope? You sort of can end with this in the book, but today, in light of everything that is happening with Donald Trump in the White House, and as an advocate for 13 years on immigration, right, um, and everything that our community is facing today, what gives you hope? So this is a question that I tried to ask um, every person that I interviewed, is what gives you hope? And um, what gives me hope is that, you know, these 50 plus conversations, everyone ended with somebody saying, I want to see a more constructive approach. I want to see something different done. Uh, something a little more timely. I was in uh, Idaho uh, three and a half, four weeks ago, meeting with, uh, on you know, Tuesday in Twin Falls with the Idaho Dairymen Association, on Wednesday in Boise with the um, Hispanic Association of Idaho. And you know, I would say half of the dairymen that were in the room were Trump voters. And they voted for Trump for you know, any of a number of reasons. But to a person, they were all terrified about the direction of the immigration debate because their workforce, who had been with them oftentimes for more than 10 years, was terrified to go to work. Um, and they were emotionally, they were, mo they were more than economically invested. They were emotionally invested in you know, their community's lives in ways that I just did not expect. So that was one thing that gave me hope in Idaho. The second piece is that the next day with the Hispanic Association, and remember, I mean, the Latino community in Idaho is about 150,000 people, so it's a very small community. But 60 people in the room, they were thrilled that the Idaho dairymen were there and they were gonna embark on a partnership to pressure the Idaho congressional delegation. Um, and this set of organizations and leaders from the Latino community in Idaho, they were not afraid because they knew that they had friends. So I figure that if in as conservative a place as Idaho is, um, and the people that you know we've gotten to know and we've met with, um, I can't hope I can't help but to be hopeful. Thank you. Uh, so we're going to go ahead and shift this conversation to you, um, and we have about 30 minutes, 20, 30 minutes to be in conversation. Um, is an opportunity for you to ask questions. Uh, make comments, share your thoughts, make fun of Ali Narani, anything you want, you know, it's all is fair. Uh, <laughs> but anyway, so we'll turn it over to you and we have our friend here who's gonna walk, or ha has a mic. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much um, for writing the book, for doing the research, for being here to talk. Um, I'd like to share just a random thing that happened to me today. I'm interning at the National Iranian American Council, the largest grassroots organization of its kind um, in the United States. Um, one of my jobs there is to take questions 
or rather answer calls, um, which is sort of the same thing. Um, so, so today someone called us from Disney and I was kind of surprised to hear that Disney was calling us because generally has nothing to do with what we do. Um, but what they asked was if we knew anyone um, that uh, we could suggest to them uh, for, for leading roles in their new live action interpretation of the movie Aladdin. Uh, for, uh, you know, they just wanted to see if we knew anyone who would want to audition for those roles. Um, so honestly, this was something that I would have, uh, at a younger age, been you know, kind of pissed off about, because you know, like, uh, for example, there was a movie that came out, uh, Prince of Persia, that they cast Jake Gyllenhaal to play the lead role in. And I was like, why can't they cast a Middle Eastern person? Um, but in this case, it seemed like they were actually trying to uh, see if there were any Iranian people who were interested in playing the role. So I'm kind of uh, interested to see what Charles' opinions would be. Um, you know, is that is that a positive uh, mark of, of of integration, or is that just shameless, thinly veiled uh, tokenism, or? I guess, how should I feel about that, just in terms of the interest of, um, you know, trying to uh, sort of fix um, issues that may exist uh, for, for all communities of persons of color uh, in terms of representations in the media and film? Thank so you. So just so I make sure I understood the question. Um, so you got a call from Disney today asking if the organization knew of folks from the Arab American community who to audition for roles. It's just from a the Iranian up. American community who would be interested in, uh, yes, the, they basically sent us a flyer um, discussing the main leading roles of Aladdin and Jasmine, yep. and if we knew anyone who, who would be interested in playing those roles. And just, just to clarify, if anyone knows who Maz Jabrani is, that guy is uh, actually on our advisory board at the organization, so maybe they had some grounds for doing so, but uh, generally, I'd like to know what your uh, opinion is. And I thought you were going to head down a, a, a the path of you know, growing up, oftentimes they would be called Prince Ali from Aladdin. So I thought you were taking Lorella serious. I was like, come on, man. Jeez. <laughs> um, so uh, uh, I think that's a really good sign um, because I think that cor you know, businesses, corporations, big and small, are responding to the changing and the really tough political debate, but they're also responding to pressure they're getting from their own workforces of how is corporate leadership, are they going to engage in this debate, engage in this cultural conversation? So I think that's a great sign. Um, as I was writing the book, I talked to folks in uh, California about um, Prop 187 and the community's reaction. Um, also around the same time, I was invited to uh, go to uh, France and Belgium as part of a State Department delegation to meet with immigrant leaders there. And from those two, conversa from those two trips, I started to develop kind of a, a different way, maybe it's a different way to think about kind of immigrant integration, which I think gets a little bit to where you are, in that um, I think that an immigrant community comes to the U.S. as, let's say, you know, Pakistani, right? My parents came to the U.S. as Pakistani. Then over time, they got their citizenship. Then, you know, they became American. Then they became kind of South Asian. So it was kind of this, you come in, you align yourself with your home country, you align yourself with your receiving country, and then there's this broader identity. Over time, you know, my parents then, you know, became business, small business owners. Um, just like many, of, you know, many families, they, they integrate in society one way or another. So there's this question of identity, changing identity, then there's a question of integration. But then getting to your point of, then there's a question of influence. And that influence that the immigrant community has is either through the public sector, everything from playing a leadership role in a presidential campaign, playing a leadership role in congressional offices or the administration, uh, uh, to running for office, or even the private sector, where the private sector is making sure that their boards are more diverse, um, that their products are more representative. Um, so there is this, uh, this kind of identity integration influence kind of path or journey. And how do we, you know, how do we go through that journey? How does the immigrant community take that journey in a way that kind of brings everybody else along? So it's not seen as something that 
uh, uh, induces fear on the part of folks who've been here for generations. But in short, I think that's a great thing that you got that phone call. Um, I always have to say this. Uh, I'm from the Caribbean, so I'm not from the United States of America. I have a green card. But what, um, I have a few questions. Um, because a lot of the discussion has been completely overlooking. Uh, there's some subtextual talk of it, but completely overlooking, in my opinion, some of the huge problems of the West at this point in time, right? Uh, you all talked about it, the, the demographic change that is creating all type of, and this is not only, let me be honest about that. I'm from a very small island by the name of St. Martin. Born in Aruba, grew up in St. Martin, a fringe Dutch island. We have seen the same thing happen back home in St. Martin, right? An island that economically took off on the, not because of anything, simply after Cuba shut down, Americans had to go somewhere, St. Martin was open, they came to St. Martin. Uh, all of a sudden, I can remember I was small, all of a sudden people who never thought much of themselves, all of a sudden it was a God bless island, unique, exceptional, superior to, better than. You know, when you come in America and you hear these, uh, you know, except you, you understand where it comes from. But the problem is that this leads to problems, right? If not dealt with. Uh, this discussion has not talked at all about, you know, uh, I mean, although you begin talking about it, what, what it means to be American and stuff like that. The problem is America was defined as a white man's country only. It, it's very founding. That continues to haunt a lot of the discussion at this point in time. Another problem is, um, so you have to deal with racism, xenophobia, and stuff like that. That was not touch, really dealt with in the discussion. I think you cannot get immigration, integration in any way without dealing with those things and simply without eventually fighting against it and walking it away. A second issue here, in my opinion, goes back to my time in the Netherlands, is that to a certain extent in the Netherlands when people come in, at least when I was there, uh, immigrants were able to do all type of little things, right? They were able to get votes on, in localities and stuff like that. That's not the issue in America, right? The, 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 how, how people can, through voting and becoming more and more part of the community, gaining political power, uh, gain a, a greater say in the community. Uh, there are different ways of doing that, and certainly that's also done in America in a different way. But you can't vote for the city council, you can't vote for this, you can't vote for that. So basically at a certain point in time you remain stuck outside. And there's talk now in the, in, the, in the present administration that people come and remain, for example, forever green card holders, right? The movement between green card holders and becoming, which made the United States always very special. You come here, as you said, you evolve, right? And eventually at a certain day, maybe you don't want to become American. Maybe it's not something you want to do at all. But eventually you say, well, you know, what the hell? Let me become American. Um, if that road is shut down, I think you create problems here. You create real, real great growing problems here in the United States because people are going to get stuck in a certain situation with no ability to move on beyond that situation. So these two issues, the issues of um, the, the undergrounding, you know, the, the, the basic issues that have to be dealt with to allow real meaningful integration to take place, right. and the issue of the evolving identity and therefore the evolving status of a person in a community. How do you see right. that playing out against what you talk about? Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Um, I think the mistake that we made is that we thought that that would play out, we could help those questions play out based on a conversation about policy or politics. Um, you know, we would say that, um, the political power of the community is growing, therefore policies will change, or these are the policies that need to change in order for uh, the immigrant community to integrate in one way or another, which is all one part of it. But I think if we, our problem has been that the only thing that we talked about has been politics and policy, and therefore you know, mo many Americans see their culture changing, are wondering if their values are changing that they, they hold dear, um, and we've ignored those questions. Um, so, I think that by having a conversation based more on somebody's uh, faith, on you know their desire to be safe, on their desire to make sure their children their children can do better than them, um, that's a great starting point um, because that for for many people that's what their fear is, um, and I just think that we've got we have to go back to that foundation, and then everything else hopefully becomes a little bit easier.
Hi. Um, hi, Ali. So I want to pick up, I'm Anna Vendanyo, I am the former Director of Immigration for the AFL-CIO. Um, and I've known Ali and Lorella for years and years. So I want to pick up on something that Lorella raised on the issue of the dreamers, your activism, and the whole issue of grassroots activism versus inside the Beltway advocacy, which I think is something that your book addresses in a way that I fundamentally disagree with. Lorella pointed out that he, the major victories under the Obama administration for immigrants came from the grassroots. Deferred action for childhood arrivals, DACA, was the product of activism on the grassroots level across the country without any support originally from the inside the Beltway groups or foundations. Um, these young people organized on their own. So Kirk Communities, um, a major enforcement action by the Obama administration was defeated because the National Day Labor Organizing Network organized against it and pushed back on state governments to do that on the national level. On the state level, day laborers and other disaffected workers won victories, the Trust Act. All of these measures were opposed by groups inside the Beltway. Not malevolently, obviously, but because they didn't fit into the strategy that had been crafted at the time. So I think that, that the lessons to be learned from that are really important and need to be really highlighted as we go forward. So I'd love to hear your thoughts on that, Ali, and how you would handle that, because Laurel asked you what you would do differently. And so I think the inclusion of affected communities is a really important issue that hasn't been discussed yet. And on that same note, I think that affected communities aren't just the immigrant communities, it's workers. So the kinds of conversations that you're describing is the kind of conversations that I see Larry here, um, others in the labor movement, we've been having for decades with union members and we saw a huge transformation. And totally agree with you that it's about really understanding where people's lives are, how those lives have been transformed by globalization and everything, and really shifting the blame away from the immigrant to the forces that are actually causing um, people to be very insecure in their own communities and in their own lives. Um, but your book doesn't talk about that. So those are my two sure. questions for you. Sure. So um, the book, in, in chapter one, I, um, you know, I try to give full credit to the Trail of Dreams and the, the walk that uh, happened in spring of 2010 uh, where four dreamers left Miami and walked to uh, uh, D.C. And I wrote specifically that they went around the organizations, the, the hand-wringing Washington D.C. Or, organizations. Anybody here representing them? Okay, just me. I, I'm the only one, right? Uh, and so I, I acknowledge that as one of the first uh, culture-changing strategies of the modern immigration reform movement. Um, I think the difference is that everything that happens in California right now, for example, is wonderful for the California immigrant community. I think the Trust Act was an incredible thing for the California immigrant community. I think the political reality of that immigrants face in Oklahoma, to take an example, is very different than the political reality that immigrants in California face. And that means that we have to have a different strategy in a place, in a, frankly, a more conservative, less diverse part of the country. Um, and that's why, for us at least as an organization, we're not going to, you know, we'll support and we're not going to worry about what happens in California. We're going to try to figure out how do we bring the allies that we need in, again, just as an example, Oklahoma, so that they are taking a more constructive approach to these issues over time. And that will be that we're going to engage, you know, socially and politically conservative folks in a state like Oklahoma that probably doesn't have deep, you know, deep penetration from organized labor. Um, and that just requires a very different strategy. Um, and the other thing is that all of our accomplishments, I think, over the last 10 years have been executive branch, right? There's been no legislation passed through Congress um, that has, I think, advanced a constructive approach to immigration issues. Um, and I might be missing something, but 
Um, that means that I think just from a, if we want to pass legislation, I think we have to understand and figure out how do we move different parts of the country. And that means that we have to be able to work with different parts uh, of the public in different ways. But they all have to be complementary. And that's, you know, sometimes that goes well and sometimes, you know, gets a little bumpy. I have a quick question. Um, what's your opinion on the border wall, yes or no? Initially, I was going to do a book, a, a pop-up book of big, beautiful walls, but uh, <laughs> opposed to the border wall. Uh, you know, from a policy perspective, we, we think that if you want to invest money in the border, you invest money at ports of entry where the majority of drugs, guns, and cash are smuggled. Um, if you want to have a smart border or a safer border, you actually have a reformed immigration system so that people have a process to go through instead of making very desperate and very human decisions uh, uh, to either overstay a visa or, or enter without inspection. But a border wall does really nothing to improve national security. Um, I feel like a lot of the um, folks you're talking about kind of coming together around these issues from different sides of the aisle and things like that um, were in the context of an Obama administration and I'm wondering if those relationships are still um, at the same level or if they've kind of taken a hit or you're reevaluating and how are they changing? So um, some people ask the question uh, in a different, slightly different way and they'll ask, okay, so you did the majority of the research and the writing before the election, after the election did you have to change anything? Um, and I don't know if this is a good or a bad thing, but I had to change practically nothing. The book and the points that I tried to make remained 98% the same. Um, because I, I think that whether, it was, you know, whether we were going to have a Clinton administration or a Trump administration, these questions that people in conservative parts of the country are grappling with, they weren't going to go away depending on who was you know, in the White House or who was in charge in Congress. So for us as an organization, how those relationships changed, um, you know, they're, they're, we have to be, they're tougher, right? Because the world is, you know, it's a little more complicated. Um, but out of the network that we built of, you know, a few thousand, if not more, kind of faith, law enforcement, and business leaders, um, I can count the amount of people who have said, okay, we're out, or, you know, you know, we don't trust you anymore, we don't want to work with you anymore, on one hand. Um, which I think is a testament to uh, the forum's staff. I mean, the staff that we have are able to just develop this level of trust um, so that, you know, we're asking the right question at the right time, we're communicating the right information, um, and, you know, like I said earlier, we're, we're meeting people where they are, um, but we're not leaving them there. Hey, Ali. To jump back to the border wall, can you talk more about the perspective of law enforcement that you encountered? Because it seems like it really runs a wide gamut. You've got the Fraternal Order of Police publicly endorsing Trump in 2016, but then I've also heard that some officers, particularly in sanctuary cities, say that policing is easier when immigrants aren't forced to live in the shadows, when undocumented Americans aren't forced to live in the shadows. So can you talk about some of those perspectives that you encountered? So in the book, I, hand, I um, interviewed a handful of, of law enforcement folks. One was um, the uh, former attorney general of the state of Indiana, Republican Greg Zeller. Um, he grew up in southern Indiana. He's a Hoosier, not an Indianan. I've gotten yelled at a few times about that. Uh, so a Hoosier living, uh, growing up on the banks of the Mississippi, he was in office when then Governor Pence wanted to bar Syrian refugees from coming into uh, Indiana. Um, I interviewed a Republican sheriff from Lake County, Illinois, a Republican sheriff from Fresno County, uh, California. In each case, they believed that you know, the oath that they took to serve and protect the entirety of their community depended on having the trust of the entirety of their community. So the term sanctuary cities is kind of a legal, you know, it doesn't exist legally. Um, but what they want to have is the trust of the undocumented immigrant community so that they can, that they're, you know, so folks report crimes. Just over the last few weeks, we've seen police chiefs of Houston and Los Angeles report that the um, rate of, of crimes reported by, from the immigrant community is dropping anywhere between 30 and 40 percent because folks are afraid that if they report a crime, they will then be asked their immigration status and being taken in. As a result, the entire city of Los Angeles or Houston is less safe. Um, the problem is that sanctuary city is such a lightning rod of a term 
um, that it's very easy to have a political debate that doesn't really advance the conversation. Um, so we really try to engage, we, want, we really try to make sure that law enforcement are the ones speaking to these issues, um, and they're making the case that in order to keep the entirety of their city or town safe, that they have the trust of the entirety of the city or town. Right here. Hi, Ollie. Um, I wanted to ask more about the cultural aspect. You said you've made a lot of political inroads, and then it sounds like with this new election and this becoming the focus of, it's been a setback for the immigration, immigration legally. Um, but it seems like just like the Super Bowl, the whole cultural thing, I mean, what, what did you think of the Super Bowl commercials, and have there been some just tremendous victories culturally as a result of the whole politics? Do you see, you know, that 60%, you know, things you didn't see happening that are, that we're getting some of the empowerment. Maybe it's not straight down to people feeling more secure about the next generation they'd like, but yeah. maybe it is. I don't know. Um, so that Super Bowl ad, the, the Coca-Cola Super Bowl ad, right? And ran the first time in 2014. And I think the way that I wrote it in the book, it was like the first time the Super Bowl audience wasn't angry about a botched call. They were angry about a commercial. Um, but it was clearly a, 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 hallmark, a hallmark moment for the country. I thought it was interesting in 2017 when Coca-Cola ran like the shorter version of the ad, who was the hardware company that ran the ad about um, uh, the ad about the family coming to the border? Um, so you see corporate America kind of engaging in this in a really interesting and powerful way, but I'm not sure it trickles down to the people who, you know, who's sitting on their couch saying, "Okay, is this something that I believe?" Um, I think that that is done more effectively through institutions that people just have a, a closer and more tangible relationship with. Not to say that you know, corporate America weighing in is not incredibly important, but you know, in Utah, when the LDS Church makes a statement about welcoming refugees regardless of their religion, that's incredibly important. And that means a lot to voters from Idaho to Utah to Nevada and to Arizona. And I think in a way that's much more uh, that's much closer to their values framework than a Super Bowl ad. Super Bowl ad helps, but it's not, you know, that's not what they hear on a Sunday when they're, they're kind of walking in the door expecting to, to you know, get cultural or moral guidance. All right, thank you so much. Um, um, well, Ali, thank you so much. You've been an admirer of your work and um, your you. passion for the movement. And also, Lorela, for in the movement of dreamers, um, I have DACA and I remember United We Dream way back in 2007 through 2010. So it's good to see you still carrying the torch. Um, yeah, I remember 2010, we were very hungry because we were joining the hunger strike. Uh, the 21st day of not eating is when we saw the, the votes in Indiana, actually, uh, where I grew up. And um, it was very devastating, of course, but also I think when I was watching the votes in that living room with 40 people who were also hungry, not only for food, but for uh, that, that piece of legislation is that I understood that I had a family in the movement. And so not knowing now being exposed here in, to the national movement, I'm, I'm glad that people are still fighting the good fight. Um, I think my question is more around, um, so we've seen throughout the years the, the kind of process of criminalizing immigrants, minorities. Um, you know, Indiana had the anti-immigrant law being introduced in 2011, it passed. We understood with that law how there was really an infrastructure of pushing anti-immigrant laws no, throughout the US from 2011. And now it's a national infrastructure that is truly pushing and criminalizing immigrants. And so with this expansion of the definition of who is a criminal, I'm curious from both of you, um, who is really t um, doing the best work to create in intersectionality, uh, kind of including not only immigrants, but LGBT, Muslims, all folks that are getting affected by this administration. Um, and yeah, in your opinion, how do we kind of take advantage of this dark moment, you know, and that there's so many attacks on so many communities, so that we can truly organize and leverage and bring in allies in, in a new way? Sure. Um. Well, thank you for being here and for being in the fight as well. I, I have felt that in the last few years, uh, that conversation has been um, at the center of much of immigrant rights organizing, and that uh, there is a lot of movement, cross-movement, uh, collaboration, and um, organizing. 
And, you know, and one good example of that is United We Dream um, is always talked about or often talked about our experience by, you know, we had a lot of LGBTQ dreamers who said, well, you know, sometimes I feel like I'm wearing the undocumented hat and then I walk into another room and I'm wearing the LGBT hat uh, or LGBTQ hat. And so um, there is increasingly, I think, and, and then there are organizations like Endalon, the National Day Labor's Organizing Network in California that have been really pushing on this issue of, um, you know, the, the worthy versus unworthy or deserving versus undeserving and, you know, pushing um, organizations and spokespeople to uh, be real about the conversation we're having and to make sure that we are not uh, criminalizing or uh, suggesting that some people are less deserving than others. Um, so I think that there is more of that happening um, and it, 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 it hasn't always been organic. I think we're, it's, it's a question that we raise more often today, um, but it's been because people have raised it and because uh, many people in the movement have pushed others uh, to recognize that. Um, I think, in, you know, we're beginning to see some of that conversation in, a little bit in Congress. Um, I think members of Congress are always uh, less willing or afraid of going there. Um, but, you know, the conversation we need to be having is if you believe that this person is a human being, right, and let's say they had a DUI and then they served time or whatever they needed to do to, to you know, I don't know what the right, what the word I'm looking for, but you get where I'm going, right? Why does that person then still need to be deported if you believe that they're a human being and they're gonna make mistakes um, like everyone else? Um, so sort of there's a different standard in the United States, but I think um, it goes back to people still don't see, you know, not enough people still don't see undocumented immigrants as people right, as American, and so they strip their rights and their humanity and their dignity, and that makes it easier for them to say, okay, well, we're gonna separate you from your family, or we're gonna pull you out of your community and send you back to a place that hasn't been home for years or decades. Um, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think we're, you know, we're having that conversation. And I would just say, um, uh, so I was in Houston uh, a week or a week and a half ago for, um, some some events and I got to know we we're doing a house party in uh, Sugarland and it was a room of you know South Asian leaders and much to my surprise one of the one of the folks in the room he was a co-chair of the Houston Ministers Interfaith Ministry Alliance and it just dawned on me that in a place like Houston so remarkably diverse uh, from a religious perspective from a racial perspective that he was identifying this interfaith council as the place where they were having a lot of these conversations. Um, which, you know, again, kind of gave me hope because, you know, it's in places like that where I think we're gonna learn the important lessons. I think we have time for like one more question. Or maybe we can grab these two real quick and then we'll wrap up. <coughs> Thank you, Ali. I'm looking forward to reading your book. Um, because uh, it seems that you've emphasized culture and that's that's important look as you can probably tell from the way i speak i'm an immigrant as you can probably tell from the way i look i'm a member of a racial minority i feel terrified at how my world and the stability and security of the world that i inhabit is subject to change how i don't understand the things that are going on around me so if that's how i feel i can imagine how people who are accustomed to a little bit more security in their cultural identity might feel so I really appreciate you know, what, what you've done and what you've, you've introduced us to here. But I guess you know, I wanted to sort of like, I don't know whether this is a question, but I think it is a question. And that is, it's about whether there's something fundamentally different. If, if cultural anxiety is what we're talking about, whether there's something fundamentally different about language and religion and everything else that distinguishes immigrant communities from longer established American communities. Because <clears throat> if indeed there's something different about language and religion, then it seems to me that if we want to be smart about this, we may perhaps want to be a little bit uh, less in your face 
I can see I'm going to get lynched once I leave here, but less in your face about the things that are particularly difficult for people to accept. Maybe we want to be a little bit more stealthy about the way that we deal with those types of particularly provocative issues. <clears throat> and then the second sort of distinction that I want to ask about is, um, you know, th a lot of the conversation this evening has been about culture, and then Lorella talks about the question of undocumented identity. And I think that these are, these might, I mean, I think that we may not be doing ourselves a service by discussing them in the same breath. Because questions of undocumented identity ultimately are about legal status. And we can have that conversation in legal and political and economic terms. But the questions of cultural identity, I think, maybe are ultimately perhaps even more difficult. And so I'd just be interested in your yeah. comments on that. So um, I don't think it, it serves our case to be, try to be stealthy. I think that, um, again, let's assume the 20% who are opposed or will always be opposed. But the 60% in the middle, they're looking for an honest conversation. And I don't want those of us who care about these issues, who are part of the immigrant community, documented or not, to feel like we have to hide who we are. Just like we shouldn't ask anybody else to hide who they are. But I do think that language and religion provide a framework or a vehicle through which to have that conversation so that people can be honest about who they are. And um, you know, I was in, uh, uh, last spring about this time, when I was doing the research, I was in Utah, uh, in Salt Lake City, um, and I was there during General Conference, which is a semi-annual gathering of the Mormon community, and it was 21,000 people in an auditorium. And a, number of the, a couple of sermons that afternoon were about refugee resettlement and the, their calling to welcome and, and protect refugees. But it all went back to their religious framework as Mormons and their own journey. Um, and there wasn't, so there was a, a real in, you know, emotional investment in having this conversation uh, within a state that's quite homogenous, you know, racially and, and religiously. Um, so I just think that you know, we, we shouldn't hide who we are, but let's think about ways that we can use religion and language as a place where uh, you can have those conversations. Um, and I just, I had your second question in my head and I totally blanked on it. Oh, the uh, identity, right. I think, so this gets to a little bit to the, what I was saying earlier and the question that we'd uh, I'd often come across in the, the faith community, the evangelical community of welcoming the stranger versus being a nation of laws. And the way that tension was navigated and is never solved, uh, the way it is navigated is that the expectation is that our government has a, a system of just laws. And if those laws are not just, then it's the duty of the, faith, of the evangelical faith community to you know, urge Congress to pass just laws, but also to welcome the stranger. But it's not an either or. Um, so I understand what you're saying in terms of there's a cultural conversation, there's a conversation about undocumented legal status. I think for a lot of people these days, it's kind of one and the same. Um, and people just see the other. Uh, um, and how do, how do we even you know, get past that point? Good evening, Ali. Um, thanks for uh, writing the book, and I'm really looking forward to reading it. Um, and I want to address this. It's more of a comment slash question for, to both of you, um, and actually everybody in the room. Um, I know we have uh, plenty of people here interested in immigration. Um, as an African American, um, and an African American who's traveled a lot and been in and around all sorts of people. Um, today I find, or in today's times, I find that we're looking at the, this, the immigration issue from a standpoint of individuality, so to speak. Um, we're looking at the non-documented non -document, non American, the um, LBGQ community, the African American community, the Jewish community, and it's often, um, as I look behind you at these pictures of these gentlemen who have fought through time for uh, equal justice and equal rights, at what point do you believe, at, if there is a point that you believe, 
would there be power um, in bringing all these communities together instead of separating them all? So rather than each of us fighting for me fighting for black and you fighting for Latina and blah, 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 and all the different segments that we have, um, when in my view, we're up against one community that's fighting against all of us. So w do you believe that there may be strength in numbers? And if so, um, how do you foresee going about accomplishing that? Thanks. Sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I feel that uh, we are strongest when we understand what our neighbor is facing. And I also feel like, like legal st that legal status is, is a very important part and of our identity and it also comes with a lot of challenges, but it is just right here at the top. And once you become you know, a naturalized citizen or a green card holder, you still have to address issues and questions about social and economic justice in the United States. Um, and you know, you're still, if you're brown, um, you know, you are still maybe a target when you're walking down the street. Um, and so I feel like the more uh, united and unified that we can be, the stronger. Um, I also feel that, you know, this is sort of going back to uh, this question about undocumented immigrants. Um, it isn't, Ali has a, a, an interest and a commitment to reaching middle America. Um, and I think that's important. When I came into this movement, my interest wasn't just let's pass policy, it was I know what it's like to be undocumented. And I know what people who are in my situation are going through. I know that some of them are wondering why should I go to school? What is the point? Um, or should we just leave? And in today's America, in, in under the Trump administration, uh, a lot of undocumented families are wondering if it's just better to leave the United States, even though they've been here for 10 or 20 years. And so my interest when I came into this work was you know, a lot about how do we get other undocumented people to feel like they're not alone, to see that they are a part of America, that they are a part of what makes our country great. And you know, I've said this before and I feel it every day. My mom's now a green card holder, but she wasn't up until last year. And I am who I am and I know what is best about this country, about our country and our values because of her. Because she raised me and because she taught me what we stand up for, why we came here, what we're fighting for every day, why the sacrifice matters, why it's worth it. Um, and so, yes, I believe that we should all be working together. And at the same time, I feel like we do need to be working with the undocumented community to answer very basic questions and challenges that they're facing every day um, that may, may be less relevant to a broader audience. So um, I do think that potential is there. I think that potential is there certainly within uh, the progressive community, the liberal community. Um, and you see that, I think, in different moments um, over the last few months, we've seen that. I would like for us as a country to uh, return to a moment last spring in, uh, I wanna say March of 2016, where in South Carolina, the South Carolina legislature started to advance legislation that would have required any refugee who came to the state of South Carolina to register with the state and would have held any organization that resettled uh, re refugees in the state uh, uh, liable for any sort of a crime that a refugee that they resettled um, would have committed. In essence, halting refugee resettlement to the south state of South Carolina. The reason why I want to return to that moment is because at that moment, a coalition of the Lutheran community, the Catholic community, the Southern Baptist community, the Latino community, the African American community, and the ACLU came together and said, we're going to advance a campaign based on religious liberty and our collective belief that we should be welcoming the stranger and, and protecting refugees. That to me was an incredible political moment because it, it, it went beyond cutting across racial lines. It cut across these really, really, really difficult political lines um, that was successful in terms of bottling up that legislation. 
And that's what we're going to need moving forward. Um, it's going to be, it's going to require a lot more than kind of those of us on the left saying, well, we're going to take, you know, we're going to beat the right. Or the those of us on the right saying the same thing about the left. It's going to take, you know, this 60% in the middle, all of us really just trying to reach out to them and bring them along. So that's what I, I think it's possible, and I remain optimistic that it will, will happen. Thank you so much. Uh, let's uh, thank uh, Ali. Thank you. Ali for coming out. <laughs>